Hello and welcome to today's Art Matters Talk with exhibiting artist Ken Beidler. I'm Kristen Butler, Director of Programs here at the Delaplaine Arts Center. Before we begin, I wanted to mention that if you enjoy our programs, exhibitions, classes, and workshops, consider supporting us by becoming a member. Members get a lot of great benefits, including discounts on classes and workshops. And you can find more information on our website. And now, Delaplaine Exhibitions Manager, Corey Fry. Thank you so much for joining us. Um... I'm really excited about our talk today with Ken Beidler. I want to remind you of a few things really quick before we get started with Ken. Uh, we're open to the public, so come on out and check out our exhibitions. We've got some great shows going on right now. Our hours are Monday through Saturday from nine to five, Sunday from 11 to five. Uh, we've got some great exhibitions on our first floor, in our first floor gallery, uh, galleries, sorry, and, some great exhibitions on our second floor as well. Um, and also, if you're at a distance and you're tuning in, you can check out our website. And um, Kristen's providing a link uh, over in the chat to our website. And you can check out our exhibitions page. There's some virtual exhibitions for past exhibitions. We also have some um, virtual overviews of exhibitions that are currently up on our Flickr page. Uh, so it, it'll give you an opportunity to, once, once we're talking with Ken, if you want to jump over there, you can see uh, some of the work in, in the space and get a feel, if you're not able to make it in, get a feel for how the work exists in the space. So, um, so go check all that out. Uh, all right, let's, let's talk with Ken here. Um, let me read his bio to you real quick, and then we'll get started. Ken Beidler is a recent graduate of the University of Delaware uh, with a master's of, uh, master's of Fine Arts degree. Ken spent his childhood in Vietnam and Indonesia, returning to the U.S. as a teenager, and he's currently living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's also worked for 10 years as a studio potter, and from 2015 to 2018, he was a ceramic technician at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. Ken, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Corey and Kristen, for your uh, introduction. And uh, thanks to the Delaplane Arts Center for um, hosting an exhibit of my work um, during these sort of strange and challenging times. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my educational background, how it connects with uh, my artwork, um, just contextualize my work a little bit in terms of some artists who are share some concerns with me around found art, maintenance art, um, assemblage art. Then I'm going to treat uh, talk a, a bit about the work that's in the exhibit a little bit and along the way I might show you some images some of some other work that I've made that I'm excited about too. We're going to do all of that in 20 minutes so uh, all right so let's get started. Um, so um, as Corey mentioned I graduated from the University of Delaware in 2020, Newark, Delaware. Um, I started studies in 2018. Prior to that, I had made mostly utilitarian pottery that was used by people uh, in their homes. So uh, bowls and mugs and plates. Uh, I have a studio in Philadelphia. Um, so I came with this really strong ceramic background. Uh, in this screen, you see me on the left, um, in my studio on the right with a number of the pieces, a number of the pieces that are in the show itself. Um, so uh, during my studies at the University of Delaware, I had the great opportunity to be a Delaware Public Humanities Institute scholar. And in that process, I um, spent a summer, well, part of the summer in Central Florida and Southern Florida, looking at early mound uh, culture. So these were Native American settlements uh, that they've discovered through archaeologists' excavations. Uh, many things about those cultures, mostly pre-colonial ceramics is what I was looking at. On the left-hand side is one of those objects that was recovered from uh, one of those sites. This is a ceramic object. But the thing that fascinated me really was the ways in which archaeologists were using 
the things they found in more sort of ordinary places like these ancient, and the word middens is ancient garbage heap. You could just translate it that way. What they were finding in these middens just at the edge of these settlements. So obviously ceramics, often broken fragments of ceramics were in those uh, middens, um, fishing net weights, um, uh, shells that were that they had made as uh, tools. But this became a kind of record of the, the daily life of people in those cultures. So on the left-hand side, is not, it's not a great photo, but it shows a little bit at the top above the museum exhibit, uh, an image of uh, one of those middens. And the thing that I was interested in was how, uh, how ordinary objects appealed to me. And I thought about the, th the artists in the 20th century, particularly that I was looking at through my studies, who really were using everyday objects to create artwork, to tell stories about, uh, about, about the life that was all around them. So I, as a kind of way to get into my work, I wanna show you a, a representative group uh, some of these are older artists, some of them are current artists, and just one image of the work and try to highlight a little bit uh, what this group of artists is interested in. Um, and they would all, they may not categorize themselves all within the same school, but you could think about them as artists who use everyday objects to make their work. So let's start with Joseph Cornell. He's um, uh, an, an artist from New York who collected individual pieces that attracted him, uh, that, that were visually appealing to him. Newspaper clippings. In this image, you see a, a score to some music, a domino, um, and all these things he kind of curated into a story and placed them into his uh, characteristic boxes, okay? So um, Merle Lederman Euclides, um, you see her as an artist in the frame on the left in the slide in front of a sanitation uh, truck. And that's for a reason, because she was an artist and resident at, in New York in the sanitation department. So she went with the workers to different sites. She collected materials from those sites. Um, she thought about how as an artist, she could walk alongside of people who did, did these kind of everyday objects and raised their profile for other people and the culture. Um, the piece on the right, I'm sorry, it's not a great image, but it's a sculpture made out of the things on the end are all gloves that she recovered from the sites that she worked at. Uh, so uh, Cecilia Vicuña is Chilean and she had an exhibit in, at, at, here in Philadelphia that I saw it wasn't this particular piece, but I wanted to show this piece because it's made out of materials that she salvaged from Hurricane Katrina. So she used, an, so there's rope and there's wood and there's plastics and there's um, other detritus, other things that, you know, that she found. And she created out of that a work of art that reflected both that experience, but I think called attention to the environment in which we live. Um, so Jean Shin uh, is a New York based artist. Uh, this piece called Chemical Balance, she made it in 2017. It's, um, I was interested in Jean partly because I met her and heard her do an artist talk and she talked about her work. Um, she had chosen a piece of mine for a show at the Delaware County Community College, which is not too far from where I live. So this is her strategy. She takes, she collects one kind of material and then she makes an installation and a sculpture from them. So she took these empty prescription bottles that really refract light in a gallery in really interesting ways and uh, created a display with them. And you know, I don't think she was making a point about, uh, you know, the use of prescription drugs in her culture, but it created a context for people to think about that, um, which is interesting, I think, for an artist. Um, so Dan Flavin is a minim minimalist artist from the 60s, 70s. Um, one of my pieces has his name in it because I used 
they constructed every day light bulb as a mold to make a piece of, uh, of, of art. Um, he took uh, light bulb in light bulbs and created these light in installations. Um, he was a part of a larger movement of minimalists, some of whom started to take their work outside. So Nancy Holt was somebody who I did a project on when I was in uh, doing my MFA studies. This is a piece that's situated in Utah called Sun Tunnels. It's using an industrial material, concrete, you know, pipes, um, and placing them in a way so that reframing the landscape through the use of these materials. I found it really interesting. And some of, you'll see when I start talking about my own work, how I'm interested in how my work may um, live outside in outside spaces. So, okay. So just as a transition, unconventional use of materials, um, interest in material history, uh, repositioning art outside of, of traditional gallery spaces, thinking about maybe social issues connected with the artwork, and then an interest in making art accessible to non-art audiences. These are all things I think that you'll see in my work that I'm interested in also. All right, so um, I live in Philadelphia. This slide on the left-hand side is of a site in West Philly close to where my studio is. Um, it's not uncommon to see entire buildings being flattened, taken out, and then the lot being reconstructed for new building. In this case, I found it interesting that as they were digging this basement, it exposed all these layers of dirt and clay, but also material, cultural material, historical material that had been in that site. So I thought about what, what is, how could I translate that experience a little bit into my artwork? I had been a, a Mason's assistant and had used these blocks here that I'll show you um, in a lot of the work that I, uh, that I, that we were making. So, so what I did is part of what I was trying to do was move from a kind of a utilitarian sort of approach to clay where most of my work was being made on the wheel. So I decided maybe one thing I could do is use molds to make work. So I took this cement block and I pressed clay into the interior spaces of it. So you see on the right, the, the just the raw clay by itself, what it looked like when I pulled, see clay shrinks when it's in that shape. So when it would dry enough, I would pull the, that shape form out of the in, inside of the cement block. And then in this previous slide, you can see the colors have changed. I put a clay slip on, on them. And then like in much of my work, I make these individual units, which then can be used in install, installing in, by making another form. So I stack these forms on top of each other. In that small stack to the left, you can see some white material. That's actually newspaper. So I played around with adding other material into that stack. Um, all right, so, okay, so kind of following, this is sort of chronologically how I was working in the studio, but also sort of my thinking, I decided I would make my own, I would make my own mold this time. So what I did is I took a light bulb with a base and I made a plaster mold from that form. And then I took clay slip, I poured it into the mold and I made these clay bulbs. Um, there, then what I did is I wanted, I wanted them to have a feeling of being a little old. So then I experimented with this technique of firing in a raccoon kiln. So what a raccoon, I'll show you images in a minute of a raccoon kiln, but the raccoon gives you these kind of cracked surfaces um, and, uh, when you, when you take the clay from, right, let me show you the, <laughs> let me show you the kiln itself. I'll go back to that in a minute. So here's the kiln with some of my other pieces in it. But um, so it's a portable kiln that you place the pieces in, you fire it to about 1500 degrees, and then you pull the pieces out of the 
kiln while they're still hot and you place them in a container like the one you see in the back on the left hand slide. That, that kind of qu quick transfer from hot to cold creates the uh, cracks in the work. In the barrel is also combustible material, which then ignites and it creates the kind of black that you see in the lines. Okay, let's go back. Sorry about that. All right, so, so this particular piece shows up in the Delaplane show in blocks across the wall in a horizontal fashion. But I've made it, I've used it to create um, uh, words. So the, I was a part of the grad biannual show at the Clay Studio in 2019. They were doing a retrospective about Walt Whitman. And so I used the first two words of a Walt Whitman poem, So Long, and I um, made a, a wall sculpture with them. I've made a check mark, I've made other forms too. Um, okay, so let me talk about this work. Uh, in the show, it's, uh, it's entitled Thick as Thieves. Um, but I've also called it after Pajarito Plateau. Um, and that's referencing a place. Um, and again, this is, uh, these are made, uh, they're of different sizes. I've installed them outside um, and uh, in different kinds of configurations. I was looking at the time in my work at Ant Hills, kind of environmental, uh, some, um, constellations or landscapes that were created by animals. But then in looking through, um, there's a picture of the kiln again. In looking through some photos, I realized that it's also remi it reminded me of a place that we used to visit when I was, when I lived in New Mexico um, and hiked at this uh, in just outside of Albuquerque, they, these a uh, tough pumice um, uh, configurations that had been there for seven to eight million years and had over time been eroded. So you can see them a little bit in the back of the picture of my family. Um, so again, in, you'll see in some of the other work I talk about the importance of place. Uh, on the right hand side are the same pieces that I installed in an outdoor setting near the University of Delaware. So, all right, so this is Crater. Um, in this image, the, the metal pole that protrudes from the wall is quite a bit longer than the one um, at the gallery and at the Delaplane. Um, and again, I, I, I was thinking about archeology. span I was thinking about sites um, when I made this piece, uh, particularly about how, when you look aerially at excavated sites, you just see sort of portions of walls protruding from the ground. Um, and it reminded me again of a place that we had visited when we were, uh, when we lived in New Mexico. This, this is in Northwestern New Mexico, uh, Chaco Culture Na National Park. Um, and, uh, and the way in which this, you know, the piece I think you know, speaks to place. It certainly speaks to the material history of clay itself, since you can really see the clay. Um, but uh, yeah, that's all I'll say about that piece. So again, connection of my work to place. All right. So the title to this piece is Kaching Sungai. It's actually an Indonesian, two Indonesian words that mean river worms. Um, Corey had referenced that I that I grew up in Vietnam and Indonesia. Um, we lived in Kalimantan, which was one of the islands. And if you know at all the geography of Indonesia, a large archipelago of many, many islands. We lived along a river and every day I would I'd be out with my friends often fishing or just canoeing. And one of the sites, one of the things I saw often was these worms that would come up on the banks of the river like in mass, large amounts of them. They would poke their heads out of the bank. And, uh, and then when you got close to them, they would all retreat. So, and they, they seem to move also a little bit with like the pattern of sun and shade during the day. So I was thinking about that, about those worms. Again, sort of thinking about insects and animals in the landscape. So I made this piece with a, 
with a with a tool called an extruder. It's basically a, a, a metal die that you push the clay through. And so I made these tubes and then uh, built them on a clay slab. If you've seen the piece in the, in the gallery, it's it sits on the floor. Um, it, it's about three feet long, about 18 inches wide. And interestingly enough, when it was installed or afterwards, there were a column of ants that were going to the work from somewhere else in the building, which I found really kind of beautiful to think about. Um, so it's entirely made of clay uh, and uh, it's actually built in sections because one of the challenges of making anything with ceramics that's large is that you, you have to work at, you know, how do you get it through the whole firing process without, um, without it cracking and breaking? So, so that's catching Sungay. Here's another detail piece of it. Um, all right, so I have about five or six more slides. Um, I had an artist visit my studio who said, you know, you, you're working with all these different, you know, sculptural forms. Why don't you think about making things in stacks as a way to just organize form-wise your, your work? So I started making stacks. These, this, this is an image of two different stacks. They're clay, but then what I did is I took broken glass from beer bottles, wine bottles, put the glass on top of the clay, and then in the firing process, that glass melted and created these sort of runs of color. So again, going back to kind of the concerns of those artists that I talked about, using an environment, a, a material in my environment to uh, to make my work. Um, and because University of Delaware is an interdisciplinary program, I often got the question, well, why are you always making things with clay? Uh, which pushed me to think about how I might start using other materials. So in my second year, I started making stacks, different kinds of stacks. Um, the one on the left, I actually was hoping to have in the gallery show but it's four feet by four feet and about five and a half feet tall. And the, the thought of trying to reconstruct it in the gallery space itself was daunting and moving it in mass would have been very challenging. There's no glue in it. What I did is I just took material from my studio from the sculpture boneyard, which, you know, the sculpture yard at UD also services the wood and the metal studios, a lot of material that was just being discarded and played with kind of relationships between material, looked at it as a whole in terms of color, texture, um, and, uh, and created a piece. Uh, it was kind of my own sort of art middens. <laughs> I mean, the things that were being thrown away, I put together. The, the, the image in the right is, um, construction brick, and uh, the words written on the column are all the places that I've lived, including the geographical coordinates of it from the bottom being where I was born all the way to the top. So again, a, uh, a piece that um, constructed from parts, um, thinking about my own biography. Um, so in March of, um, 2020, we lost access to our studios at the University of Delaware. So it, it, it kind of pushed me to think as an artist outside of a studio as a place to make work. Near where we live in Philadelphia is a park where um, the water department was doing a project. And I found myself just spending more time outside for one, for one thing. One of the things that I found at that site was this polypropylene twine. Um, they were reseeding the area after a construction project. It was twine that had first had tied together straw bales. So I actually sourced some polypropylene twine from somebody else who, from, a, from an individual who was recycling the material and just tied the lines together and made this ball. The image on the right is, um, is um, a piece that I made that was installed at Palumbo Park in South Philadelphia as part of a sculpture show. It's entitled Upside Down and it was intended to depict what an ice cream cone might look like when it was dumped onto the ground, of course, you know, sized up. 
So I used that um, ball then to, to, to make the sculptural work. All right, and then the last thing I wanna talk about are the six uh, clay sculptures that are part of uh, the show. Um, so there is a trend in 20th century ceramics to try to, some of it from an environmental concern, uh, to try to recover some older firing techniques. So uh, 20th century ceramic artists in the US have experimented with you know, wood fired kilns. So that's what this is. The image on the left is a wood kiln at the Marian Art Center in St. Petersburg, Florida that I helped to fire. That's not all my work in it. That's the work when it was filled, the work of about 20 artists or so. Um, it took three, uh, three full days and three nights, almost four, three and a half, four days to fire the kiln. So it involves introducing wood into the kiln to get the to get the kiln to temperature. What it does also is it disperses this ash from the wood onto the pottery. So in this next image, you can see on the right hand side, there's this line where the ash moved more onto the piece. And on the right hand side where the piece was much more protected. You see that also on the left hand image. So I think this is another part of what I'm trying to accomplish in my artistic vision, thinking about how the wood from a particular place, the kiln from a particular place, really can create a certain identity in artwork um, that's really environmental and focused, focused from, you know, that, that, that's designed or made partly because of the context or environment it's in. Um, that, that body of work, I'm also um, playing around with this sort of like line between utilitarian and sculptural objects. So I came from a kind of utilitarian background and uh, all these objects, like the one on the right, especially references a little bit like a teapot or some kind of pouring vessel. But then I've added these, all these elements that kind of make it strange and change it. And so I'm, 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 I'm trying to push in my artistic vision, uh, the forms beyond what you, you might initially see uh, in a lot of the, particularly the utilitarian pottery world. So um, this is my contact information. Uh, I'd love to talk to any of you more about, um, about my work, an image of some of the work that I've been making more recently. Um, and a contact information for me. So thanks again, Corey and Kristen. It's been uh, great to be a part of this uh, conversation about art and uh, thanks for hosting my work at the Bell Plain. And uh, yeah. Kenton, thank you so much. Man, really, really fascinating stuff. Um, I've wrote a bunch of notes down and I'm trying to think of how to make coherent questions out of them, but um, I want to, because I feel like we could just chat about some of this stuff too. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to open up the opportunity and and let everyone know that's joining us um, that if you have any questions for Ken, you can submit them in the chat or in the question and answer box at the bottom of the Zoom panel. Um, and I'll be keeping an eye out for those and we'll read those over to Ken. So please let us know if you have any, any questions. Um, I think where I want to start, Ken, since there's no questions to begin with, is I want to ask you about the shift from making utilitarian objects to to more uh, objects that are that are focused on maybe narrative or aesthetics, these sort of things that eliminate the functionality of the work. Right. Um, I mean, I'm thinking. Your, your mindset in making utilitarian objects is, is caught up in the marketplace. You're thinking about what's going to sell, how it's going to be popular, um, uh, how it appeals to that sensibility, like, right. and, and probably, probably even, you know, how things feel in the hand. Like if you're making a cup or something, you're, you're thinking about things solely from, from that utilitarian level. How can this thing be utilized? Right. Is it, was it for you a challenge to, 
shift gears and sort of shift your perspective in thinking in a different direction. And, and, and I'm curious about what helped you make that shift too. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, and, and I hope that, you know, what I said um, about that shift didn't in any way, you know, invalidate that perspective. I think that's one of the really gifts of ceramics to the larger art world is this, you know, to be able to use a mug or a plate that is aesthetically pleasing, but then that you, you, you can incorporate into your everyday life, I think is a really yeah. wonderful thing. Um, it, when you're trying to make a living doing that, then all those questions, like you said, around marketplace, uh, kind of finding your niche become more important. It feels mm. like then the making of the work itself. And I think I had grown, you know, I had grown uh, weary, <laughs> uh, kind of tired of seeing those questions as the primary ones that I kind of asked myself when I entered the studio space. Mm. And that sort of ignited the interest in, in, you know, an MFA program where I could really start to link my work to this, to larger concerns. I don't think that in the end, it's answered the question about how to be an artist who makes a living in, you know, yeah. in the world we live in. I think uh, I'm actually carrying mail right now <laughs> as my sort of like, you know, uh, job to make the ends meet. And I, yeah. I, I, in some ways, then the art changes. I think it becomes more about investigations, um, interest in uh, working with the material while setting aside some of those other questions. Um, but in terms of my process in the studio, you know, I had, I had, uh, you know, I had friends in the program that were doing photography and making, you know, sculpture with wood and metal and doing performance art. So I think all of those things started to push me to thinking about one, maybe how biography connects with the work. Like what do I, what is, what is my own experiences that can sort of like act as a conduit to the work itself? Yeah. And then I think I wanted to, from a kind of a craftsperson kind of skill oriented approach. I wanted to just push myself to make work in different ways. So then I started making things with molds. I started, you know, pushing things into shapes, not necessarily because I was trying to make something beautiful, but because I was trying to learn about the material processes that were different than the ones that I had started with. So. Yeah. No, that's, that's, I think, you know, one of the things I think about a lot as a studio artist is, you know, the, the thing that we, we sort of assume that the thing that connects us with art history and that, that we're in a lineage of is that other artists have shown work in museums and galleries. And if we get to that place, then we're, we're stepping into that lineage. But yeah. the truth of it seems to me to be that, you know, these artists of the past, all most of what they were actually doing was following curiosity. Yeah. And, and when you follow your own curiosity, that's actually what links you yeah. to, to this art historical lineage. So yeah. um, that, that way of thinking is really, it's really interesting to me. Yeah, it seems like the recipe for continued sort of like life and passion for art, you know, mm -hmm. in the studio. And, and I think, and I think the question of how to translate that curiosity into a larger viewership is really, that's hard, but maybe that happens more naturally over time. Mm -hmm. And maybe it only happens like we see in art history, only happens when the work gets recognized after the person is you know, gone. Sure, yeah, so, um, yeah. Um, one of the other questions I was thinking of, so like at, at first, looking at your work and spending some time with it in the gallery, I was like, Ken is, I wonder if Ken is making up civilizations in his imagination and then creating these objects like as, a, as an imaginative way, like of this person maybe made this thing and it was found. 
but after hearing you talk and it and it's making more sense to me that I was listening as you talked you used the word reminded a lot and you used um I was thinking about you said a lot yeah and so so I started thinking you know like this isn't about past civilizations and you just said that you were interested in biography yeah and and so you know as you're reminded of your past in vietnam and indonesia as you're reminded of these archaeological sites or, or the middens that you'd seen in the past you're it's so interesting to me that you're sort of creating a narrative of your own memory more yeah. than any more than some made yeah. up narrative from some civilization of the past am i making yeah. any sense there no, that's that's really. I mean, I'm. That's really helpful to me. I, I think you've articulated something that um, that I'm. You know, in some ways, the you know you once you make a piece, then you start to work backwards <laughs> from the piece to say, now where did that piece come from? Yeah. Like, like I can think about it in terms of how the material were made and the process. But then reconstructing or creating a kind of story related to it is sort of a second work, a second mm -hmm. kind of creative work. And I like the way you're talking about that. I think, I think I, I, I have not. I so I'm almost fifty. I am fifty years old, <laughs> and I've I've not gone back to those places since I was fourteen years old. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of maybe through the work, a kind of a recovery of memories yeah. or a kind of a concretizing or a kind of a, a imagining of some of those, you know, real material things that were in my environment um, uh, when I was a child. But that's, that's interesting. I actually sort of like the idea, too, that and maybe there is a piece of that to creating an object in the present that could be seen as an artifact of a future civilization. So like those ball, the, those electric, you know, bulbs. Yeah. They, they're, they're distressed looking They're, I mean, it'd be interesting. I just thought of this now, but it'd be interesting if some, one of those would be found next to a real light bulb and then yeah. the kind of like confusion that that might create. And it, it's also, building a little bit, I didn't talk about this, but the kind of Trump Loy tradition where you're you're trying to, and there is this tradition in ceramics where you're trying to trick the eye mm. to see something that looks real, but it's actually made out of ceramics. Yeah. So, no, that's that's really that's interesting. A rambling answer, but I do no, like, that's great. I li I like the help, I like the way in which you frame that. No, that's so great. I mean, one of the things about the bulbs a la flavin piece in in the exhibition that was it's it's really it's really intriguing but also a little disorienting because you know reading through your artist statement like you get a sense for what middens means and sort of this um this jumping into the past sort of or 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 memory or these sort of things but then all of a sudden you're faced with something that you see every day like it's it, you haven't you haven't distorted the object to where it's something unrecognizable it's yeah, there yeah, yeah and and it's stripped of its ability to do the, to be utilitarian it's stripped of yeah. its ability to give light you know in the way that it was made and so in a certain sense it was like a little i mean not confusing but um but maybe something like that in a in a really good way yeah like to where your mind immediately goes to narrative like why are these things that i know exist and i see every day why are they here and why are they the way that they are right now and arranged the way that they are yeah and that and that's a, that's a little bit what i was trying to get at with some of that sort of short art history <laughs> <laughs> which I hope people kind of stuck with me through. I was just trying to show that it it does seem like there is this this there's a strangeness if there's a strangeness in the work that yeah. does is not quite recognizable that 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 increases the interest in the work itself. So initially I actually had a a, a slide of Duchamp's The Fountain. 
-huh. as kind of that sort of moment where like an everyday object got reframed in, a, in an art context and created this kind of like dissonance. Yeah. Of, so I think the art, the light bulbs are a little bit of that same trying to, and, and, and actually the uh, Thick of Steve's pieces too, hmm. you know, they, they could reference, I've had people mention to me, they, they reference a little bit like those electric insulators, old electric insulators on, yeah. on poles. Hmm. I was getting a little bit more at like Ant Hill's sort of thing vibe, but then there's, they also don't correspond to anything else. So it's yeah. like, sort of like, I feel like uh, that's one of the things I'm trying to accomplish in my work is to, to hit that space of both recognition and not recognition. Yeah. Because I think that's an interest, that's for me as a viewer of art, an interesting place to go. Right. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I mean, the, the beautiful thing there is that you're, so going back to the memory thing, like you've made something that, is maybe tangentially connected to to your memory or or your own um, sensibility, yeah. but other but there's enough space between how the work looks and how it's presented that that the viewer can come in and say, oh, that's an insulator from something. But you're saying like it can be both of those things yeah. because of that space between the representation, like that that. I'm with you. That is the interesting thing about art is that the viewer comes in and adds to the meaning of the work. Right. And that and that's where an artist talk both clarifies and maybe also shuts meaning down, because once you start talking about the <laughs> genesis of a work in terms of where it comes from, then it's all of a sudden like, oh, well, those are worms from Indonesia. That's all sure. I have to think about now when I look at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, oh man, no, that's great. Um, let me look at my notes here really quick. I was interested in some of the works that you were doing with stacks. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was thinking a little bit about along with middens and the site that you showed in Philadelphia, like the excavation site, sort of that the stratification of the earth, like the lamination that exists there and how that's, how you're, that's a way of uncovering on an archaeological site, um, but you're actually building, like you're you're building the stratification in stacks. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know. I I don't know that I have like a very meaningful question around that. It's just an interesting. That's an interesting way to explore. I think. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that you know. I think that strat the strategies for that stratification were different in some of the different stack stacks. So, um, you know, the the column with my biography was temporal. So, you know, I was just kind of like, in some ways, that was that's the easiest, most straightforward one. I think that you know the the middens one. It, the, the layering could have been, I mean, as I'm thinking about pushing myself in this direction more, like thinking about how that material cre creates or tells an even more distinct story. Mm. And in the, and in, and it would be interesting in the site in West Philly in that, you know, in that construction site to, to try to maybe think about what each of those layers meant in terms of context and history. I remember mm -hmm. finding like broken bottles and other things that would I think have represented particular time periods in that yeah. you know, site's history. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think you're right in that the stacks are sort of referencing time and thinking about the, the, the layers between the, the, the lay in the layers as part of thinking about the work. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's super, that's super interesting. Um, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but I want to, if anybody has any questions, you can throw them out there. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I'm interested too in just that. Um, I was really interested in what you were saying about environment and sort of uh, 
in the in the wood fire kiln, the ash sort of playing a part, and then maybe the chance operations of Raku firing and how it's cracking. Like you're leaving you're leaving something up to you're not completely controlling yeah. where where the work ends up. Um, you're leaving something up to like the materials connection with temperature and and just all kinds of different variables I would imagine is it hard for you is that coming from like making utilitarian work that has to be maybe precise to a certain degree you're you're tipping that thing on its end and you're like leaving something up to chance is there anything is that something that you're thinking of is it hard to let go in that way well, that's that. I mean, when you started sort of talking about that, I thought about how that is that kind of comes full circle to one of the first questions you asked about sort of that transition from utilitarian work to ceramic sculpture, however you want to kind of define what I make. But yeah, um, the answer is yes, it's hard. But I think that that's one of the real gifts of ceramics is that they're that you're creating this moment where you kind of lose control of the process mm. and you're giving the fire, the, the firing process, um, even the wood that you're using, the kind of wood, how much salt it has in the wood mm. can sometimes affect the work. Uh, you're giving that its own factor in making the work what it will look like in its final sort of phase of yeah. being, you know? and. Um, there is something that I think, you know, that that addresses the, the kind of humility that maybe we we all need when we, we come mm. to making artwork is that kind of like, we try to control all the pieces of it, but maybe sometimes the best things that happen are the, the accidental and the, the uh, un, unpredictable or un, unexpected things. Um, yeah. So now there, I will say that, <clears throat> I think that that in the wood firing community that there has started to shift more of a sense that like an artist is someone who even in those unpredictable circumstances like a wood kiln tries to tries to control a little bit how yeah, yeah. the work turns out and mm. uh, because there are sort of beautiful moments that you're trying to create in the kiln. Yeah. And so there is a skill even in, in craftsmanship in that. Yeah. So, um yeah yeah it's interesting i mean i so i mean i use a few different disciplines but in painting in particular we're always painters are always talking about overworking a piece to where you like you've masked not that you've mastered it but your attempt to master to master it actually strips it of its its ability to be interesting in some ways yeah yeah, so i'd imagine that that's a fine line to walk um of like, but also a really interesting one about sort of maybe stewarding this, um, stewarding this process that's existed for so long yeah. um, that you're you're constantly thinking about how you can control it, but not control it too much. That yeah, that's super interesting. Yeah, um, I think about it. I think about it in some ways like cooking. You know, like there are sort of cooks that approach making something as like you start with a recipe and you follow Mm. exactly and that can get you so far but that there's something that may happen when you look in your refrigerator and you just look at the materials at hand and you make something yeah and something gets added to that process I mean you're drawing on your skill from making the recipes Mm. making food from recipes yeah but then you're and you you maybe not don't even know how you're translating those skills into that sort of more imaginative you know I don't know if that's a great analogy but I think about it sometimes because I'm more of the look at what's in the refrigerator kind of cook you know and make something gotcha no I think it's a great analogy um well we're drawing to we're we're drawing close to our conclusion time I wanted to ask you do you have anything are you working on any projects right now do you have anything in your sites that you have wanted to work on but just haven't been able to that you're thinking about doing any any upcoming projects for you yeah so i mean one of one of the 
one of my tasks as um, you know post uh, MFA program is just to, to 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 actually spend a little more time with the work I made and try mm -hmm. to figure out what are some of those themes that kind of run through the work, um, and then build on the pieces that I think are really that really still kind of hold my curiosity, like mm -hmm. you were saying. Yeah. Um, I still actually, because of the pandemic, it's been challenging just to kind of uh, continue to work. And so I have, I still have work at the University of Delaware. So actually collecting all that work back into one place is one of the things I'm doing, <laughs> taking photographs of it and, uh, and uh, trying to figure out kind of what's, what's next. So yeah, do you, um, do you as a follow, just a quick follow up question, just because we're an art center, you know, like the Delta Plains an art center. So we're interested in education and a lot of our education means having materials at hand, but you're talking about taking it even a step further where you're not necessarily working with the materials, but thinking through why, why you made some of the things, how do you, how do you go about just as some, if there's anyone watching that's like, I don't really, I haven't really thought about why I use the things that I use. Yeah. What are some ways of exploration that um, that you're seeking out and uh, yeah. and maybe digging up some of that stuff? Well, I mean, uh, we were really encouraged, and I, I think there's a place definitely for writing as a tool mm. for that um, kind of process. I think taking photographs, trying to um, look at the work from different perspectives and maybe, um, you know, arc, not archiving, but looking at it at, through the lens of a different viewership might be mm -hmm. another strategy. Um, I've actually started to wonder if some of my finding places for my work to live outside, um, like those, you know, the Thick as Thieves piece. Yeah. And because I think that pieces that may change the piece living in an, an outside environment, which I kind of find interesting mm -hmm. because the material starts as clay, that's a part of the earth, like how, how might the work return? Yeah. But then also that kind of like that, having it out there in the world also increases the responses to it and the mm. ability for people to interact with it. So, yeah. um, so maybe I'll put that, uh, Kaching Ching Sung Guy piece outside and see if I can get some more ants to live in it. <laughs> yeah, for those that are watching, we had one day, um, one of our staff members was, saw some, a trail of ants walking through the hallway and, and they worked their way, like it was, they were making like a beeline for one of Ken's pieces in the gallery. <laughs> um, and we don't know where where they were headed at in there but they just sort of disappeared when they got to it uh we've taken care of the problem we don't have like an <laughs> ant problem or anything at the Dell plane that's not what i'm saying but it was super interesting like um yeah like why are these things attracted here but that's yeah. a little bit of the yeah. story that ken's referring to so kevin um really fascinating work i've really enjoyed spending time with the work in in the gallery um and it's been great talking to you today and hearing about some of your process and, and your thoughts well thank you very much for the question and answer and for the opportunity to share my work with uh, the del plains arts community and beyond so, yeah absolutely sure thank you again to ken and to you for watching while you're on our channel check out our other videos and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified about other new videos from the del plain